why are we discussing about this topic today so nosocomial infections or hospital acquired infections what are they basically they are acquired during the process of receiving health care the patient doesn't have these infections at the time of admission when the patient gets admitted in the course of admission maybe after 48 to 72 hours the patient will develop a new infection which is not previously present so why are they important infections acquired in the intensive care units they they cause a significant contribution to morbidity and mortality caused by microorganisms which are highly pathogenic virulent aggressive and require higher antibiotics icu acquired infections increase patient length of stay and leads to cost in excess so you are now very well aware that why these infections are important in the in the context that they cause they increase the morbidity and mortality and in turn the length of stay and also the cost okay anybody can uh, ask the doubts if you have in between or raise your hand if you are not understanding anything yes, so these infections what how do they occur is either you are the source if you see the diagram either you are the source wherein the hospital personnel who are the staff who cause the direct infection or in turn the hospital equipment medical equipment implants and dis and devices they cause the indirect infection to the host so these are again i'm going to stress they are not present when the patient has arrived or he is not incubating the infection is just got them new from you or from the hospital where he is admitted okay that is clear next so i was telling about these infections i said they are very virulent they are very aggressive they are very pathogenic so how are they different from the community acquired the community acquired pneumonia for example if you see the most common organism will be streptococcus pneumoniae staphylococcus and haemophilus influenza whereas if a person is admitted in the hospital the vent ventilator associated pneumonias or hospital acquired pneumonias they are all together different in the sense they are caused by a drug resistant or uh, or organisms which require higher antibiotics which have multiple uh, uh, organ involvements and which take a longer course to treat so these usually the hospital acquired infections are escherichia coli pseudomonas klebsiella and in our center we face acentobacter which is very common the others being clostridium and candida albicans so the annual cost in such cases is very high like as depicted in the uh, this picture wherein each of the ventilator associated surgical site infections central line blood stream infections c diff infections and catheter associated urinary tract infections all these cost us so much in terms of money in terms of resources and in terms of morbidity and mortality to patients so being aware of these infections and being aware of how to prevent these infections is very important when you are practicing or when you are a physician or a staff working at the hospital to protect your patient and also yourself from these infections next so how do we go about this so steps in infection control is a step wise manner where in you assess the need for isolation should i isolate my patient identify whom should i isolate and who are the patients at you no know, at the risk of nosocomial infections how do i educate myself and to the staff about hand hygiene follow standard precautions 
follow transmission based precautions and use specific strategies pro focused on prevention of nosocomial infections consider environmental factors and it is always a teamwork you yourself washing your hands or you yourself wearing glove and mask doesn't prevent nosocomial infection in the entire setup it is a teamwork and the organization the admin staff everyone including the housekeeping the uh, all the personnel should be involved and educated so assess the need for isolation whom to isolate when you go next next slide assess the need for isolation so whom should i isolate can you isolate all the patients humanly impossible that much of resources or that much of isolation may not be there so you have to isolate a patient like a neutropenia wherein the tlc or the wbc counts are less is having some immunological disease wherein his he will catch up the infection like a post kt or a post transplant patient a diarrhea patient a skin rashes patient with a skin rash or a non communicable disease you are suspecting some communicable disease known carrier of an epidemic strain of bacterium and need we we can't forget a covid patient or a h1n1 patient are are the patients who need isolation next so what type of isolation then comes should i put them in a room put the doors close and segregate the patient away from the routine icus no is the question there are two types of isolations one is a positive pressure isolation and a negative pressure isolation what is a positive pressure isolation so there is air around us and this air is at a at a temperature and a pressure when in a room if you are maintaining the pressure above this atmospheric pressure or the surrounding pressure it is called positive pressure so the bacteria or the air from outside will not enter inside because it is positive and this prevents the person getting infection from the other contaminated or from the other sources so this positive pressure is used can anyone tell me in the chat box what is the positive pressure in which type of patients do we use positive pressure i request all the attendees if you have a please post your answers in the chat box or q and a session so <clears throat> so positive pressure who whom do we use positive pressure is the patients who are immunocompromised who catch up infection who catch up the normal common cells on the body may also be uh, may also invade the body in an immunocompromised patient so in such patients we protect them from the other sources or other contaminations or and we take strict contact precautions and see that it is positive pressure is maintained then coming to the negative pressure the pressure inside the room is slightly lesser than the pressure outside the outside to prevent the negative because because of the negative pressure whatever is the organisms or whatever is the source or whatever are the airborne infections are curtailed or are within the room itself so that they don't transmit the infection to the other staff or the medical personnel or the person visiting or the person visiting the patient so can you tell me who are the source or who are the patients who should be in negative pressure isolation so anyone can post them in the chat so the negative pressure isolation is required for tuberculosis patient covid patients h1n1 patients wherein the airborne infection or the airborne or the small droplets can cause the spread of infection to the staff or the medical personnel so you are very clear that the protective isolation the positive pressure wherein you maintain the pressure positive pressure within the room so that the person or the patient will not get infected 
and the negative pressure wherein the person or the patient will not infect the staff so these are the isolation types of isolation and it is you know uh, we have two isolation rooms in each floor of us and we can convert a positive pressure isolation into a negative pressure and sometimes there may be a mistake in converting a positive and a positive or a negative pressure or the vice versa that is uh, sometimes by mistake a positive pressure is maintained for a negative pressure so we need to check the pressures before the manometer or the meter will be placed outside so you need to check the pressure before uh, shifting a patient and you have to be sure that you are based you are placing your patient of tuberculosis in a negative pressure isolation room